Right, hiya. Um, I'm not sure how much anyone knows about um, floppy disk preservation or about indeed the data that you can get off floppy disks and the kind of stuff you can save. Obviously there's quite a lot of different formats of dumps of floppy disks and a few different methods for doing it either in Beebs themselves or um, in PC or with um, like GoTech or Grease Weasel, or what kind of stuff. So um, I'll just sort of go through what I've got in my notes as to what I've discovered and um, how I've got on with archiving software. Um, so my, as you said, my name is Jasper Reno Clark. Um, on Twitter, I'm Femtosonic because Picosonic had already been taken. So I'm Picosonic on GitHub and on Stardot and a few other places, but on Twitter, it's Femtosonic because that was the next SI unit that was available. Right, so this is the finished board that I created. Um, so the Raspberry Pi connections on the bottom right hand side, the 40 pin standard Raspberry Pi um, GPIO header. Um, the left hand side you've got a 34 pin um, Shugart compatible um, header for the ribbon cable that goes to the drive. And then it's pretty basic really, there's, there's just a couple of jumpers to switch between 8 inch and 5 inch disk drive um, index pulse lines. and the side of the sorry the the disc select you can select on the jumpers as well um other than that it's mostly just pull up or pull down resistors and a couple of open collector hex inverters just to get the signals to the right levels because the, the drive wants five volts and the um the pi wants 3.3 so that's that's the underside of the board showing the raspberry pi connection header at the bottom there and just a quick shot of them, how they connect together. Now, the reason I, I did it like this was because I still wanted to have access to the, um, the video and the, um, the, the capture and, and the video outputs. So I, I did it as an offset board like that. Um, and the reason it's as big as it is, is because I'm, I'm a bit of a novice in terms of um, circuits and soldering and all that sort of stuff. So I wanted to make it as, as big as possible for me to be able to make the board up. Uh, and this is it connected up with the Pi uh, working. Um, so on the left, you've got my dual Kumana drive. Um, that, so that's the original one that I had um, back in the mid to late 80s. And that's got an 80 track, 40 track selector switch on the back. Um, although to be honest, most of the time I have only ever used um, drive zero and, and two on the, on the right hand side. Uh, and I'm using a PC power supply because the I'm not just not sure of the status of the power supply inside my um, drive. So I'm just using an external PC one. And the in, internal connection for that is just a standard Molex. So this is the um, floppy wiring diagram for the BBC Micro. So on the left, you've got the 34-pin the Shugot connector. And you can see where there's, where there's the jumpers to go between 5 and 8. Um, and the, the side select jumpers, and you can see the um, the 8271, the Intel 8271 on the right hand side and how they connect together. So I use this diagram um, and a few other old 8-bit computer diagrams to sort of work out the kind of stuff I needed in terms of pull-ups and pull-downs and what was expected and the kind of levels of stuff that would be coming from the drive. So this is the schematic for my circuit so you can see the the level shifters that, that you know the hex inverters going from right to left to go from the pi to the board so you've got the load head which um, starts the motor off the direction that's just to say which way you're going to be seeking the seek pulse um the right data which to be honest Although it's wired up, it's something that I'm not really that interested in because I know that old floppies are sort of crumbling a little bit and my main focus was in preserving the data off them rather than writing new stuff. Although I do like the idea of it potentially being connected directly to a Beeb or any other device that requires it to, to work in a, 
a fashion a bit like a, an emulating or floppy like a GoTek or something. Um, so then you've got this, the signals coming from the drive. So you've got the, um, where are we? The index pulses, the um, track zero detector, uh, and the read data. So those, those are the main ones really. Now the read data I've got going into the SPI port because I'm able to read from that very, very quickly. And all the other levels other than the, the write data, which is also on an SPI port, all the other levels go to GPIO with the appropriate pull-ups and pull-downs. So I had an issue for BBC Micro back in the 80s. Um, I played a lot on it, mainly Repton, a lot of Frack, Thrust, Elite, Chucky Egg, that kind of thing. Didn't do too much sort of productivity style stuff, but I did have um, Whopping Editor and I had a, a Quest mouse um, and a few other packages back in the day, but mostly it was games for me. Um, so in the mid nineties, I started transferring the files off the Beeb individually. So I, I wrote a program in basic to um, talk to the serial port and it basically just converted the, um, the binary files on the disk into an ASCII equivalent so they could be sent down a serial cable and received in, I think it was hyperterminal or, or something back in the day, and then saved to disk as individual files, which I then reconstitute. Um, later on, I used a PC five and a quarter inch drive in a 2x6 um, to do whole disk image dumps, which I was then able to get all the files out of. Although at the, when I was doing that, I learned that the, um, at the Acon disks, they start with sector number zero. Now, the, with the data that's stored on, on the disk, um, the track numbers always start from zero. The heads always start from zero. So on, on Acon disks, they, the um, sectors also start from zero. But on PC disks and a lot of other disks, they start from one. So when I first started imaging disks, that was one of the kind of gotchas that I found out that it wasn't getting all the data correctly. And it's just because the different numbering of the sectors. Uh, and you can see on, on the cable on the image at the bottom there, You've got the BBC five pin DIN on the right. And then um, it's now going to a USB connector because my current PC doesn't have a serial port on it. So that's the way that I've been connecting up to the Beeb. Um, so in about night night five, I started writing a Repton 3 game for DOS and um, Richard Hansen of Superior Software got light of it. And he saw that it was running with the, the old BBC micro graphics. And so he sent me the Archimedes Repton 3 um, floppy disk so that I could um, use the updated graphics in the game. And he helped me with some play testing of it. I think at the time he, he was thinking it might end up being a commercial release, although it never actually did. But um, I think that was the, the kind of thinking back then that he was helping me out. Um, so you can see the, the comment, the compliment slip at the bottom there that he sent me in, in uh, April 97. Now I didn't have an Archimedes at the time. And so um, I had to write a program on the PC to image the disks so that I could actually extract the files from it. So I created a program called ArcImage and I've made that available online as well. Um, it's it's on, my, on my GitHub. Um, and the images that were created with ArcImage were then used by the early Archimedes emulators like Archie and Red Squirrel. And I think one of them even had a mode where it was able to read from the disks directly as well. But in, initially, um, a lot of the images, certainly that I used and some of the people that I knew were emulating Archimedes were created using the ArcImage program that I created. So I had a bit of an understanding of what was on the disks and like the raw format of ADFS and all that kind of stuff, but um, not a great deal. It was more a sector sector dump. So uh, copy protected and stuff like that just didn't work. Like on the Archimedes Repton three game, the very last track I think was unformatted as part of the copy protection. So you couldn't read that. So that, that ended up with a short, um, short dump um, because I just didn't understand why it didn't read. I didn't understand anything about copy protection back then. Um, the program was also picked up in 2001 by Tom Humphrey, who extended it to add support for reading 1.6 megabyte ADFS F type images. So fast forward a little bit, those um, files that I was able to extract from the Archimedes, I went on to um, 
write unofficial ports of Repton 3 using the Archimedes graphics to the Nintendo Game Boy Advance, which you can see on the left, my son's having a, a play with that, and the Sony PlayStation Portable on the right hand side. And this, the PSP is showing um, a pirate Repton level that I made back in the 80s. And I think that was the only level, I, I made an awful lot of levels back then, but that's the only one that I actually completely finished and did all the passwords and everything for. So that, that was my initial um, uh, experience with trying to image floppy disks and getting data from them that from uh, using systems that it weren't, they weren't native to. Um, so then in 2016, quite a lot later, I decided to um, have a go at imaging some, some more of my old disks. I kept all my disks. So I've, I've got a massive stack of disks at home um, and I just wanted to image them all so I could do something with them. Unfortunately, when I turned my beeb on, I, I got the magic smoke and the um, machine stopped working completely. Uh, I did fix the power supply and it started working for a bit, but then the, um, the keyboard connector, the ribbon cable on that went a bit brittle and that broke as well. And I, I replaced that, but I've, I've never got it working again. So I'm not really too sure what's going on with that. A friend of mine is trying to help me at the moment look to get that working again. But in the meantime, I decided I wanted to try and image them. Um, I found a project online, <clears throat> which is linked at the bottom, the virtual floppy project that was using uh, a Raspberry Pi to pretend to be like a GoTech to emulate um, disk drives for TRS-80 computers. And so you'd, you'd load that up with the disk image and then that would then serve the disk image on to the TRS-80 when it waggled the right um, pins for stepping and, and reading and writing the heads and stuff. Um, but I wanted to do it the opposite way around. So I kind of, I, I did my circuit very, very loosely based on that and combined with some of the um, schematics that I found in the BBC circuit diagram and some other computers. And um, I tested it out first using breadboard. Um, things started to look okay. The, the signals that were coming from the driver okay, so I knew that the driver was probably all right. But then the wires and the breadboard were a bit kind of loose and so they didn't really stick in very well and I just got a bit fed up with it. So a friend of mine at my office, um, he repairs old arcade machines for a living, or a hobby, sorry, not a living. And um, he's encouraged me to make my own PCB because he's done quite a lot of that himself. So for the very first PCB I ever made was, was this one. Um, so I, I designed it all, uh, did the schematics, did, did all the layout, then um, sent the PCB off to China to get manufactured. Um, so that was over Christmas 2016 that I had that manufactured in China. Um, and yeah, the, the project's all online. There's, there's a link at the bottom to, to my own project. The, the GitHub link is, is to my uh, ArcImage project from the previous page. Okay. Um, yeah, so the, the, the first run of boards came over in 2016. So I've, I got them in January. Um, using the scope on the Kumana that was built in 1985, it's still working. Um, I was able to see all the data and everything, so I was really pleased with that. Um, but I wasn't really very familiar with any kind of floppy imaging formats for, for very raw flux data. So this is like the really lowest level of, of data you get from the drive, almost um, like what they call a forensic level of data. So it, it's pre, prior to the, um, the FDC getting its hand on it and, and any kind of data separators, it is just that literally the pulse is coming from the drive. Um, so I knew the SPI was fast enough to read that. And I, I think it's, 12.5 megahertz it, it samples it out um, and I, I decided to have a, a buffer of a one megabyte which was very roughly three revolutions and that created 80 megabyte disks for single-sided 80 track disks so it was a bit um, a bit serious really it was <clears throat> a very big file so not very um, easy to work with and it soon filled up the Raspberry Pi SD card um, so next, the hard part kind of came in that I wanted to um, make sense of the data itself, um, capturing it from the drive. Um, so here's a little a slide about um, disk sizing. So most people think of eight inch disks, five and a quarter inch disks and three and a half inch disks, whereas actually that's the size of the jacket that the disk is in. 
the discs themselves are in millimeters. They're 200 millimeters for an eight inch, 130 for a five and a quarter, and 90 millimeters for a three and a half inch disc. And they're all set by standards organizations. Um, and also the other thing that surprised me was that side zero is not the label side. So I was thought on a single track disc, the data is stored on the same side as the label is on, but it's not the case. The side zero is the underside and side one is the top side of the disc. So this is the inside of my um, five and a quarter inch Cumana drive. And I was surprised when I took the lid off to find out that it was just a standard PC compatible drive and I could just add it in to any PC and it would work just as well. Um, so you can see that the ribbon cable at the top left is um, an edge connector ribbon cable and the bottom left there's a standard PC Molex type connector and in fact the, the dual height um, 40 track um, BBC Micro branded drive that I've got has just got a, a uh, an adapter from the power out from the BBC Micro going to a Molex connector on the inside of the case which I was quite surprised. I, th I thought they were all quite proprietary, but they're not, they're, they're very standard and you can swap drives between different systems quite easily. Um, the one thing that's missing in this picture though, is the, see the little blue, um, on the top left by the ribbon cable, there's a little blue unpopulated um, sort of, it, it's the resistor pack basically for, for the dual drive. The second drive of the two has got the resistor pack in and the first one hasn't so it's like the terminator at the end of the end of the line. So when I plugged that drive in directly it didn't work correctly and it was only when I realized that it was missing the, the resistor pack and that I needed to have both drives connected that it actually works or, or I could have the one with, with, with the terminator on and that worked as well. So in terms of signals coming from the drive um, you can select the drive by its ID, either A or B or, or zero or one. But I, as I say, I, I added a jumper to do this because most of the reading I was going to be doing was only ever going to be to one drive. I did toy with the idea of having support for dual drives so that you could image two disks at once, but I, I didn't end up doing that. So it's just a jumper. So if you want to use this with um, PCs, they're normally set to be drive one. So you need to make sure that the, the jumper is set to DS1. And if you want to use it with um, single drives for the um, Acorn machines, then you need to set it as DS0. So then you, you'd start the motor up. Um, they normally spin at 300 revolutions a minute, so five times a second. Um, some drives spin at 360 RPM. So one of the first things you need to do is to sample that pulse time of between index pulses. And that will give you an idea of how fast it's running. And then from that, you can work out how long in time a or, or rather how, how how long a pulse will be or between the um, the flux changes so on a 300 rpm it's four microseconds on a 360 it's slightly less because that's running at six rotations a second instead of five so having got the motor going um sometimes there's a in the timing diagrams for data sheets there's a there's a thing about um waiting for the amount of time for the drive select to happen and the the motor to start before you start doing any stepping and stuff like that. And I think I'm, I'm quite generous with my timeouts because some of the old drives take a bit longer. Um, and I'd rather be slightly more generous than, than under generous and have to have like a switch for you to change it to, to, to allow it to have a bigger delay. Um, so once you've um, got, it, got it spinning and you verified it's spinning, you then need to step to the track that you want to capture and then either have it as the, the, the top side or the bottom side using the, the head select, although most of the single sided drives will only ever be one anyway. And sometimes they'll just ignore the, the head select um, signal. Um, but you'd also always start from track zero because that's a known point and the drive will actually tell you when it's at track zero. So if, if you always step back to track zero, which is the outermost track, you can then step in to the one you're interested in. So the, um, the catalogs that store what's on the disc are normally in track zero and that's because it's got the longest amount of magnetic material for one rotation of the disc so the bits themselves are kind of stretched out and they're they're a bit less susceptible to noise and interference so to be able to increase the reliability of the catalogs they're always on the um, outer track 
although the Commodore 64 and a couple of others have got them in the middle and they do that to try and improve seek time between the catalog and, and the files themselves. But most other systems, they're, they're at start at track zero. So once you've stepped to the right track, you then need to wait for an index pulse. And that, that's caused by light shining through the little hole in the disc in the jacket. So there's a little light that shines normally from underneath to the top. And then there's like an LDR that will say when a, um, an index pulse has occurred and that'll send it back to the, the FDC so that you can start capturing from that point onwards. Um, and that's just because some, um, some discs are aligned to the index pulse and some aren't. Now my, software doesn't really care where it is it, it you can have sectors that straddle the index pulse and it, it doesn't really care about that because it, it does several capture several rotations of capture to allow for um dodgy reads on the first or second pulse uh, f uh, rotation and to allow for sectors to straddle over the um the index line um also an another good reason for capturing multiple revolutions is that if you've got copy protection with weak bits you'll get different reads on different rotations so that's one thing that you can you can check for by doing multiple reads you've also got um, variations in drive speed and jacket slips and stuff like that which can cause changes to the speed of the data which can cause problems with the reads so if you do multiple reads you're, you're more likely to get a decent one as long as the heads are clean of course um, so once you've aligned yourself with the index, it's a case of um, sampling the data coming from the read line and it comes through the whole time the disk is spinning. So there's a quick uh, couple of slides about the actual encoding. So the BBC Micro uses FM encoding or single density, which has got a four microsecond per bit cell window and it has two standard flux intervals. So a bit pattern one is four milliseconds between pulses and a bit pattern of zero one is eight milliseconds between pulses. So the ones are the clock pulses and the zeros will be the data. So you, you won't get zero one. Um, so the clock will never be zero unless it's uh, in an in, in address mark. So the diagram at the bottom shows them interleaved. So you've got clock bits first and then data bit second. So once you've synchronized to that stream, you then need a data separator to separate out the clock and the data. Um, in MFM encoding, which the Archimedes uses, and I think the double density DFS use, um, you've got four microseconds, the same as FM for standard double density, and that's uh, a binary 01 will be four microseconds, a 001 will be six, and a 0001 will be eight microseconds the higher density two microseconds bit cell window so you've got two milliseconds three and four and then extra high density is a one microsecond window so you've got one 1 1.5 and two millisecond not microseconds sorry uh, the final type of encoding that i've encountered is gcr um, so there's a number of different encoding schemes which fall under the banner of gcr and these differ between the data stored on the disk to comply with the AGC rules. So disk drives have got automatic gain control. So when there's no signal for a while above a certain threshold, it amplifies it until it sees the data. Um, but if you've got too many zeros written in a sector without the clocks, because the, the uh, MFM only has clocks when there's lots of zeros, um, when, you, when you've got big um, gaps, the AGC will ramp up and then that will cause um, bit errors because you'll get the, the noise floor will raise up in, in, into above the threshold and so you'll end up with data that's not valid. So the encoding that gets saved to the disk kind of guarantees there'll be a certain number of ones compared to zeros so that you won't ever get to the point where the AGC is going to ramp up. Now I know occasionally this is used for copy protection as well. They, they, on purpose, they wrote, write lots of zeros to the disk and that causes a lot of noise so that when you read it a second or third time, you get different data. And I think that comes in under the weak bits banner. Um, so GCR is commonly used on Apple II and Commodore 64, or rather was commonly used. Um, and this Commodore 64, for instance, uses five bit patterns on the disk to represent four bits of data. 
the Apple uses two different formats. There's a um, six and two and a five and three. So you've got five data bits and two kind of guard bits or six data bits. No, six, six and two or five and three, sorry. So when you've got six data bits, then you could have much more densely packed data on the disk. So that, that was a later addition to Apple IIs. And I found that the Kimiana drive that I had with the BBC Micro could read all of these encodings absolutely fine. It didn't really care what was on the disk. It just read the flux patterns back and, and sent them back to the FTC. And it was the FTC's job to kind of make sense of it. So as I said earlier, there's these things called address marks on the disk within the flux patterns. And the next sort of hurdle for me was to, once I got the flux data back, was to try and make sense of it. And in making sense of it, you need to find out these patterns within the flux data of um, address marks. So in FM, you've got uh, an index address mark, which you don't get very often, but it, it, is, it is part of the standard. And you'll see it if you look at the 8271 data sheet, you've got the um, sector header address mark. So the IDAM, and then you've got the data address mark. So here's an address mark of FD, and you can see the, the data and the clock bits are in red and blue, and then the yellow and black ones are the missing clock bits to uh, allow it to be detected. But the surrounding the missing clock bits, you've got ones in the data bit, so that it doesn't cause problems with the AGC, but at least it allows you to synchronize the stream so that you can uh, recover the data. So this is a, a diagram from the 8271 data sheet that I use quite heavily when I was extracting the data from the disks and it shows you what order things go in in, in, in standard disks. So you've got, um, you've got the gaps, the various different size gaps, pre-index gaps, post-index gaps. Um, you've got the um, CRCs that go on the end of the blocks so that you can verify the data. You've got the um, amount of size of the sectors because different disks have got different size sectors. So the earliest ones had 128 byte sectors, then 256, then 512, and Archimedes uses 1024. Um, I think there's five, five sectors per track at 1024, I think it is, and that the Beeb is 10 per track at 256. Um, so diving into that a little bit, you can see the ID uh, address marks I've got the, the mark itself with the missing clock bits. Then you've got the cylinder or track. On, on here, it's saying between 0 and 74, but it actually goes up to 79 for 80 track discs. The head address, um, the record address, or the record, yeah. So that's like the sector number. And then the sector length. And the sector length is in, um, in a format, so, so um, zero will be 128 bytes, one will be 256 and so on and so on. So it's a power of twos. And then there's two byte 16-bit um, CRC, which uses the standard CCI TT 16-bit um, CRC. Um, let me see, so it's got an initial value of FFFF and a polynomial of 1021, um, but different systems do use different polynomials or different starting values. Uh, for example, Amiga MFM discs use their own CRC. Commodore 64 and Apple use a one byte exclusive OR, so they're more prone to errors than a, a two byte 16 bit CRC. Um, then moving on to the data itself, so immediately after the ID address mark, you've got the data address mark and that is simply just the, the mark header with the missing clock bits, the data itself of the size specified by the previous ID address mark, and then the two CRC bytes. Um, and quite often you see um, deleted address marks. So when you delete data off disks, you get a DDAM. So it's, it's almost exactly the same as a, a data address mark, but it's just marked as being deleted. So you can still recover data from it. So it doesn't actually change the data itself. Then once you've got sector data back, you then need to validate it to make sure what you've got is, um, is correct. And as I say, the ID address mark and the data address mark all have a 16-bit CRC, which you can look at. And as, as I've got there, you've got the FFFF as the initial value and the 1021 as the polynomial. Uh, and then the Amiga disks, as I say, have got their own format, as, as do the Commodore 64 and the Apple II. 
So once you've got validated sectors back, you can then look at them to determine what the logical format is. In other words, which operating system or, or um, filing system has been used to create the disks themselves. So I wanted to try and add support for as many different types of disks as I could from different systems, including being able to catalog the contents because although it's tempting to want to sort of archive absolutely everything, there will be some things that you might value more than others. So to be able to look at disks that haven't got a label written properly or the labels fallen off, which is quite a few of mine, the labels kind of come loose, to be able to read what's on them before imaging them so that you can kind of put them into a must image pile and mm, I'll image that if I've got time or if my drive still works kind of pile. So I thought I'd added a cataloging facility in. Now most of the disks that I've got at home are DFS, ADFS or MS-DOS. So those are the ones I've focused on in terms of getting the catalogs out of them. So in terms of Acorn DFS, um, I found the, the B wiki on mdfs.net very useful for that because it, it, it explains quite well how all that's laid out. So in terms of the validation and actually doing the cataloging, I've, I've used a lot of the information from there quite heavily. And the ADFS, um, I'd already done a bit of work on this, mostly guesswork, as I say, when I extracted the repton levels from the Archimedes disk I, I spoke about at the start, because I didn't have an Archimedes. Um, and I found the RISCOS programmer's reference manual and the source code in the CVS, the RISCOS CVS um, dumps, that was quite invaluable in detecting ADFS formats. So the software that I've written to go with this um, bit of hardware can detect old and new maps at the 18 bit, the old and 16 bit sector sizes the old, new, and the big directory formats. In other words, SML for the 8-bit ones, and then DE, uh, F, and then E plus and F plus, and G, which is a format that I don't think many people are familiar with, G format, but it was spoken about in the in the source code, the risk or source code. So it's basically a new map with seven zones, a new directory uh, format, but I wasn't sure on, on the boot format for that. Uh, all the ADFS disks obviously are MFM encoded. Um, so the G1s are octal density, 20 sectors per track, one or two four byte sectors, and they can store 3.2 megabytes across two heads that are interleaved with, with 80 tracks. Uh, I've moved on to MS DOS detection because I just happen to have loads of MS DOS disks, some five and a quarter MS DOS disks, and some three and a half MS DOS disks. Um, so I was able to try uh, imaging both with the, the, the BBC drive I had, I was able to read PC disks in that, as well as use uh, a PC three and a half inch drive to uh, extract data. Um, so I found on Wikipedia, there's a link at the bottom there to the, to the page, the file allocation um, description goes into a lot of detail about how to read the data off the disks to be able to catalog them and to be able to work out what format they are. Um, so I've got support for FAT12, 16 and 32, uh, including long file names, um, deleted, deleted files, um, dates and times, all that kind of stuff all gets printed out on the, on the catalogs. Right, so along with the flux data, it's possible to get the right protect status from the disk. So whether there's a sticker on the side or whether it, a notch hasn't been cut, you can find that out by in, in, interrogating the, the line on the drive. Um, you can also find out the time between the index pulses, so one revolution, and that allows you to tune the drive because sometimes over time the drive speeds will vary slightly and it might get to a certain threshold where the computer isn't able to read the data and it might just need recalibrating. Uh, commonly, as I say, this is 300 RPM, but sometimes it's 360 for newer drives, especially PC ones. Um, so when writing disk image formats to support metadata, I extract the disk title from the catalogs. So for, for DFS, ADFS, and MS-DOS, I extract the, the title of it. So when I'm writing to FSD format and um, teledisk format, I, I carry the title across, although you can overwrite that with a command line option. Uh, I can also detect flippy disks without the need to flip them. So I've got some flippy disks that don't have an index hole on both sides, and I've got some which do. So you can actually physically flip them and others uh, which when you flip them, it, it ignores the index line for whatever reason, but I, I can image them without it needing to be flipped. And that that's done just by sampling the data and then just literally reversing the bits for the, for the whole dump and it will extract the data perfectly fine doing that. 
So the first tool I created was a drive test tool um, to enable me to test that the PCB was working at all and it wasn't going to blow up and make sure that it, the signal levels were correct and you know the, uh, the interface between the Pi and the PCB were okay. Um, so it checks to see if disks are detected and the drive is detected first and then it checks to see if the, uh, the disk is the heads are at track zero and tells you whether it's right protected or not and gives you an approximate RPM. So this can be used to tune drives and to make sure the signals are coming back okay. Uh, if you've got a broken index sensor uh, or a hard sector disk, so that's one with lots of holes in it rather than just one index hole, then you want to run some tests requiring a uh, floppy to be inserted without requiring a floppy, sorry. Um, you can specify no index because the drive test tool will wait until it's got, uh, or rather not, not continue if it doesn't think there's a disk in there because if the disk isn't in there it's not able to determine the rpm or the the right protect state or anything like that so it put no index will allow it to continue if, even if there's no index so you can optionally also count the number of tracks that the drive can step to um because quite often they will step past 80 tracks and in fact lots of disk duplicators would write data in the 80th or because they're not to 79, so the 80th track or the 81st track will quite often have um, disk duplicator in information in there, including the the date and time that the image was written, and they make a model of the um, drive itself, the, the duplicated drive. Um, and finally, you can move the head in and out uh, by seeking to spe specific tracks using the drive test tool, so just to make sure that everything's working. So the, the BBC FDC tool, which is what I wrote to um, initially image BBC disks and to pretend to be a floppy disk controller, hence the name BBC FTC. Um, so that's intended for capturing raw RFI flux data from floppy disks and optionally converting it to SSD, double-sided DSD, FSD, so Bill Carr's format, um, TD0, which is a teledisk format, uh, or ADF or a generic image file, so just a sec generic sector dump. Uh, it's designed to work with floppy disk interface PCB as discussed previously attached to the GPI of the Raspberry Pi 2 or 3 and that I've actually now tested it on the 4 as well because it it wasn't working on the 4 because the, the BCM 2835 library that I found they didn't have a version for the Raspberry Pi 4 although that did come out fairly soon afterwards after the Pi did. Um, so the Pi 2 and 3 run at 400 megahertz not overclocked and the Pi 4 runs at 500. So as part of the code it detects what hardware you're running on and it'll adjust the um, the clock speeds appropriately to be able to get the best capture it can from the, the hardware and, and with some modifications it can be made to run uh, on a Raspberry Pi 1. So the problem with the Raspberry Pi 1 obviously is it's got a different size header it's not got the standard 40 pin header that the, the 2, 3 and 4 do so you have to make some changes if you want it to run on a Raspberry Pi 1. Now it, in theory it should do but I've never actually tried that and that will run at 250 megahertz, so it's, it's slower again. Um, so I've done output to DFI, which some people were saying that they, the RFI format that I had kind of invented um, wasn't really usable by any other software or applications and nobody had heard of it, obviously, because it is one I've invented. So I had to go at writing out to another format and disk ferret was one that I heard at the time was popular, so I had to go right to that, although I haven't, been able to confirm whether the dumps I'm doing with that are, are fine or not so I've, I've not been able to test it but they pass the validation from what I can tell from looking at the format on, on the website the file format um, so by default the sectors are sorted by their physical position on the disk regardless of uh, which of the three passes uh, the data was found in um, the sort option allows them to be sorted logically by sector ID so most disks they'll have sectors starting at zero for ACON or one for non-ACON quite often. Um, so when you do the passes, if, if like sector two failed to read on the first pass, but read okay on the second pass, if you don't sort it, then sector two will be tagged onto the end. So it'd be in a funny order. So by putting the sort in, it sorts them logically by the IDs of the sectors. Although that will fail if the um, disk includes copy protection with some strange sector numbers in there like in the hundreds or whatever then it'll be in a funny order or some discs even have the same sector number multiple times so it's a bit confusing for the um for the drive to know which uh or rather the fdc to know which um 
sector the user is requesting. So the, the user will request like sector two from the FTC that will then sample the data, separate the data, look at the IDs and stuff. But if it finds it multiple times, it'll just give back the first one it's found. And I think that's used for copy protection as well. So just quickly going through some of the options that it can do here. Um, the uh, the version of the program that runs on the Pi itself is mainly useful for just doing the images. Um, but once you've created those images, you might then want to convert them to one or more different formats. And so the non Raspberry Pi hardware has got a minus I option to specify the RFI file that was um, captured on the, on the Pi itself. Um, Cause the processing is a lot quicker on a PC or an, another device, the Pi itself. It, it's, it's okay, but it's not the quickest to do the, um, the data cause there's quite a lot of it. Um, Catalog in the disks, as I say, you can do with minus C, and that only works for DFS, ADFS, and DOS disks at the moment. Um, SS will force single sided capture, and you can optionally add zero or one to say the upper or lower surface. Um, DS will force a double sided capture unless it's being written to a single sided format only, like SSD, SSD, or SDD, or if FSD is a single sided as well. Um, minus O will specify the output file with one of the following extensions. So you've got the RFI, which I've discussed, DFI for the disk ferret, SCP Supercard Pro is one that I'm working on at the moment, so that's not finished yet. SDD, DSD, DDD, FSD, Teledisk, generic image, and ADFF, ADFF, ADF is also a generic image sector by sector dump, but I think the Amiga and the um, our communities use ADFS quite regularly. Um, the SPI divider you can specify and what that does is it changes the clock sampling frequency of the SPI um, bus itself. So it can either be 16, 32 or 64. If you go much outside either lower or higher than that range, then you don't get good enough data coming back from it to, to be useful. Um, but in changing that number, you can um, get higher resolution captures, which sometimes work better and sometimes don't because sometimes you get more noise in the signal. Um, minus I will specify the number of retries. Uh, that doesn't work for the raw format. So RFI, DFI, SCP and raw. And the point of that is if you've got a, a, no, a disk with a known number of sectors like DFS or ADFS, if, it, if it's detected what the format is, it's expecting a certain number of sectors to be there. So you can say, keep retrying track one, two, whatever, until you've got all the sectors. So you, you can adjust that R number until you get a, a, a better um, capture. The sorting I've already talked about um, sorts, them, sorts them logically by the sector ID prior to writing. So when you do a, dis a sector by sector dump, you can have them sorted by the sector ID. The default, if you don't specify that, is to save them in the order they were found on the disk. So from the index point onwards, it will sort, sort, store them. Uh, summary will give you a summary of the operations that it's done. Um, minus L shows you a layout diagram. So where the text sectors were found on the disk, I'll show that in a minute. Um, minus sectors allows to override the number of sectors. So if the uh, auto detection mechanisms don't work for whatever reason, or if you know what the sector number is and you don't want it to go through the auto detection, you can force it using minus sectors. Uh, CSV was something that um, was added um, by Andrew Barnes on Stardot and he wanted to be able to do multiple captures using different drives on using the PCB and then be able to stitch together the, the good tracks that come from different drives because he thought some of them were slightly better than others. Uh, the title you can override, sorry I missed one, the, the, the maximum track number you want to step to. So when capturing it, it detects that it's either a 40 or an 80 track disc and it will just capture those tracks but as I say Outside of that, you can have the um, disk duplicator data written on an external uh, a track past the end of the disk, or you can uh, have copy protection, which relies on data being past the end of the disk. So you can do minus Tmax to allow you to specify what track to try stepping to. Um, the title can be overridden. So for the formats that support metadata, you can um, write the title to them, like Teledisk and FSD. Um, or you can override it. So 
formats that don't have it, you can specify what it is. It'll say unnamed otherwise, or you can put the um, leave it as it is, and it'll take the title from the disk. And then minus V is verbose, and it is very verbose. You get a lot of data come back from the drive, and to be honest, there's too much going on to be able to read it in real time. So I use that sometimes for debugging it, and I would capture that to a file and be able to look through that file at my leisure to work out what's going on. So a quick demo. Let me um, swap over to my other screen. Um, okay. So here's an example of um, capturing. So this this was a file that was sent to me on Stardot of somebody who had done an RFI capture. Um, and they were trying to write that to an FSD, but they were having problems doing that because it wasn't working for, for whatever reason. So what I've got here on this command line is it's running the NoPy version, so it's running on a PC. The minus C will give you the catalog. The minus I gives you the RFI input file, and the minus L gives you the layout of where the sectors were found. So if I just run this, you can see the um, it's telling what it's sampling, the data it's got from the catalog, in, in a sort of fairly familiar format. Uh, and then at the bottom, you've got the sector layout. So the S is the sector header, the D is the data. And to be able to do the catalog, it's just looked at um, the first sector. So if I, um, if I specify an output file, FSD. So this will now sample all of the tracks, but only one head. And then you've got a layout diagram there of where it found the sectors and you can see there's no there's no gaps in there so if there was a bad sector there'd be a gap in the middle of that or you could see um let me see if i put a summary on the end and do a minus o then you've got a, the sector summary there. So it's showing you for each track, the sector number first, and then in square brackets, you've got the head that, that was read from. And you can see there's no, there's no gaps in there. All, they're all sorted and they're all in, in order. So that's, that's a good capture. So having done that, you've got another call cool called um, check FSD. And that I wrote to make sure that I was um, dumping the FSD files correctly. So if I just, use the same one and put that through more so it just, it just reads what's in there so you can see some of the data there you've got the the title that's been read from the disk itself uh, the number of tracks and each track is then it then shows you the the data in each one including the sector id so you've got the cylinder head sector and then the, the size of it okay Go back to the other one. Um, right, so I've had a few questions about my um, the RFI dump format that I've invented, and the kind of the rationale for me doing this was I, I didn't know at the time any other um, well used dump um, formats. And so I wanted to create something that was as close to what was coming from the drive as possible. So, so literally the SPI bytes that are coming from the read line. So every, every bit of the eight bits of a byte is one sample of the SPI line, either high or low. So if it's all ones, it means the line was high the whole time. If it's all zeros, it was low the whole time. And that enables me to store not only the timings between the pulses, but when exactly the rising edge happened and when exactly the falling edge happened. So you can work out the pulse widths as well. Uh, and it stores metadata in um, JSON format, so JavaScript object notation. And the reason for doing that was to allow uh, it to be extended without breaking stuff in, in older versions. So an older version of the BBC FDC program would be able to read newer RFI dumps as long as you didn't change the encoding format completely because it could just ignore the um, key value pairs that it didn't know about. So if somebody else did a dump and they wanted to, to put their name or the name of the tool in it or something or some other properties that they were able to read from the disk, then older 
versions of FTC could just ignore that or, or older programs which supported the FTC uh, RFI format rather could, could ignore that. So they are completely pure sort of unmodified um, dumps of, of the whole lot, uh, warts and all, of what the flux is on the disk. Um, Da, 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 da. Yep, JSON talked about that. Raw samples. Yep. So I did actually uh, add um, functionality in BBEM to read RFI files, although I don't know what I've done with that <laughs> version of um, code, but I had to make quite a lot of changes because the, um, the sector IDs and a few other things were fixed size. So you couldn't have like 8 bit values in there. They, they were fixed to what the, they should have been. And that meant a lot of the copy protection schemes just didn't work. So um, I have actually managed to image Repton Infinity disk, which uses the same copy protection as Exile. And I've been able to play that in BBEM with the copy protection intact. So further development, a few people have asked me to, to make some changes to it over the years um, since I started in 2016. Um, so these, this is a list of things that I am doing or would like to do with it. Um, now, I'd like to improve the data processing and use a software PLL. At the moment, I don't use any PLLs at all. I just use um, a modulator and then um, timings. And then it's got like a almost sort of 30 or 40% tolerance and margin of error. So it's quite tolerant of, of data that changes and like jacket slips and that kind of thing. Uh, but it doesn't have a PLL. So if the sectors are written faster or slower than what it's expecting. It, it sometimes won't be able to pick them up correctly. So I, I want to write a, a software PLL and I found a few other projects which do utilize that kind of thing. So I've been looking into that and it's something I'm quite keen to do. Um, I've put in basic Apple II and Commodore 64 GCR support and that was just based on me being physically given those disks and being able to image them in my rig. Um, I didn't have a lot of documentation about how they worked, although I have had some. So that's something that I want to complete to be able to do um, good Apple II um, captures and Commodore 64 captures for people who've got their disk as well. Um, I'd like to look for and parse the data um, from tracks past the end of the drive, e.g. from the disk duplicators that I spoke about earlier. Um, I've also would quite like to add in fingerprinting of disks to help identify disks that are not known to preservation. Um, I heard that um, Disk Beast was going to, um, or does rather do that, and so I, I would quite like to put something in to be able to output um, CRCs in, I think the CRC32, I think Disk Beast uses, so that's something else I'd like to use in the future. Um, improve the detection of um, handling of disks where one size 40 track and one size 80 track, so a lot of games, particularly some of the superior ones I've got, are 40 track on one side and 80 on the other, and they're flippy disks. So improve the detection and imaging of those. Um, the SCP format, as I say, is, is in quite early days still. I've only just sort of started putting it in last month and there's still quite a lot for me to do. There's a few things in there that I don't quite understand yet. So some people have sent me some example SCP files. So I'm, I'm going through those to try and work out uh, what I can do to improve the compatibility of those. Uh, also people have asked for HFE support but I've, I've heard that SCP files can be converted to HFE files quite easily. So I'm not quite as keen on doing that just yet. Although I understand some floppy emulators and maybe GoTex or whatever like HFE files better than SCP. I don't know if that's right. Um, also a few people have asked me for write support and although it is capable of doing that, I, I'm not really motivated enough to want to do that yet. I'd rather get the, the reading and the archiving down to, to a much more reliable level and, and um, allow you to have lots of con configur configuration options to um, to get the best out of it. Um, just because the the disks themselves are failing, like the magnetic materials um, peeling off and the um, they're getting mold and, and dust in them. And to be honest, some of the disks that I've put in there that people are giving me make a he heck of a noise when the drive's rotating. So I, I don't really like <laughs> imaging them and have to clean my heads afterwards. Um, but it is physically wired up to allow writing of data. So in theory, it could be used like a, a GoTech or something similar to be able to emulate um, disk drives with disks in. 
Um, so this is some of the reference material that I used when creating the PCB and writing the um, the code to be able to read the data. So the Intel 8271 data sheet was, was very invaluable, as was the Western Digital 1772 data sheet. I found various floppy disk manufacturer, drive manufacturer data sheets. So the drives I've got, I've got a few different ones and the data sheets themselves tell you the tolerances that the drive will allow you to run in, like how much time you have to leave between stepping, how much, how much you have to wait after doing a head load or unload, that kind of thing. So they're, they're quite useful for, for getting the tolerances right and to work out what actually is coming out of the drive. There is a set of standards published by ECMA. Um, they're numbered there, 58, 59, 66, 69, 70, 78, 99, 100, and 125. And they go through from eight inch disks all the way up to three and a quarter inch disks. And they're all free to download if you just search online. So a number of those were very useful to me in, in working out a lot of what the standards should be. So all the drive manufacturers and floppy manufacturers had to make their equipment to match those specifications of the ECMA. Um, there are ISO equivalents as well, 8630, 8860 and 9529 are some equivalent ones to the ECMA ones, but you have to pay to be able to download them. So you, you may as well get the free ones because it's exactly the same information anyway. Um, a friend of mine gave me a Commodore 64 1541 disk drive book and that helped me a bit with imaging the Commodore 64 disks. Uh, the Beneath Apple DOS book is a, is a good book that tells you about the, um, the various different formats used by the Apple II, the GCR and the, the 6 and 2 and 5 and 3 encoding formats. Uh, for the DOS stuff, I got a lot of information from Wikipedia. It goes into a lot of detail about the FAT formats and long file names and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the ADFS, some of it I already knew and a lot of the newer formats I got from uh, the programmer's reference manual. Um, and the Revolutionary Guide to Assembly Language by Rocks Press is a really old book, but it's got some good stuff about DOS FAT in there. So at the bottom, there's a link to my GitHub page with the project, um, the BBC FTC project in it. Um, there's been a number of, over the years, a number of links people have talked about my project or uh, like it was on um, Adafruit blog and Geeky Gadgets and a few others. And I've got an image here, which is taken from Star dot of um, Philip Pearson is somebody I sent one of these to who has created a disc imaging setup with three and a half inch discs. And um, he's actually mounted the Pi on the bottom left there in a, in a box. So the ribbon cable comes out from that to the Pi and then goes onwards to the, um, the drive. So he's mounted the, the connector for the Pi at the top rather than the underneath. So it's, it's a bit neater because it's all in the same box, but he's used a PC power supply as well at the top. And a few thanks. Um, so Gerald Holdsworth from Stardot, who, who I um, found out about through the Repton resource page. Um, I helped him um, decode a lot of the old Repton game formats and he was writing an editor at the time. Um, he helped me with some of the ADFS formats and encouraged me to publish the project on GitHub plus he posted about my board on Stardot from which uh, several people bought the initial run of the blue ones. Um, the RFI images have been sent to me by people um, and that's helped me to tune the data extraction process which has um, allowed me to Im improve compatibility. Um, Andrew Barnes as well on Stardot, he's given me some code contributions on GitHub for double density DFS, solid disk DDFS and what for DFS. And special thanks also to Jason Stonier for helping out by getting several batches of the boards made and taking the time to solder all the components on, send them on to people on Stardot, and he's been making SD card images to get people going. So thanks to everyone for all of those. Any questions? So I've got a question from John Brown asking, do you think it would be possible to use the Pi FDC to read some of the variable speed disks? That's for Victor Sirius 9000, for instance. Well, the data you get back is the raw flux data. So it's just a software problem to be able to actually interpret what's come back from it. So, so you would, yes. I mean, in its current state, it doesn't because it's expecting the bit cell windows to be fairly consistent, but it, it, there's no reason why it couldn't do. Okay. 
I'll um I'll ask a live question if you can if you can hear me. I've just just yep. popped in. Um, that was that was fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, you've saved me some trouble in my my upcoming talk in the next slot. Okay. okay. Save some time explaining some things, which I thought you did really well. And um, I just wanted to note that I thought that the trick of reading a flippy disk by just reversing the fluxes on the on the top side, that's that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm, su I'm surprised it worked to be honest, but yeah, it does. No reason it shouldn't, I guess, right? Um, and that that probably helps preserve disks as well, because some of these flippy disks don't like to be flipped because they've been spun one way all their life, right? Yeah. Um, that, that's awesome. Um, I just wanted to say, if you want to collaborate on some of those things on your um, future work list. Uh, like like disk beast compatible CRC 32s, uh, I'd be really really happy to to do that with you. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. I, I saw the project on GitHub, and I've I've seen a couple of your previous talks, like with oil daughter and stuff. And um, I think it'd be good to have a collaborative effort on identifying unique disks by having the the CRCs like you were talking about. Cool. Well, I hope you've got time to catch my my talk up next, and I'll oh, yeah, go yeah, through. Sure, yeah. I'll go through how the CRC 32 is is formulated and. Some of the things we've found using that as a as an identifier. Great, yeah. Just briefly uh, drop my own on that. Um, I'm actually the guy who designed the disk ferret, so I'm a little bit tickled to see that you use my uh, data format there, uh, Jasper. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> If you want to collaborate on that as well, if you want to loop me in, I'd be happy to share what I've learned developing that yeah, okay yeah be good yeah um i've got a, a list of things on my screen i'll uh i'll pop in at the end because uh, we're starting to get quite a few questions now anthony curtis yeah basically my question is um generally there's a lot of projects out there for deleting and preserving disks from usa computers like apples and stuff um but it's less about the uk computers like the amstrad cpc 6128 the spectrum plus three um even the Amstrad PC, um, even the Amstrad PC has DOS Plus, which supports CPM, um, and so there's actually some stuff in CPM on those. Um, is there any um, idea to support any of those? Um, well, at the moment, it's got a standard 34-pin Shugart connector. So as long as the disk drive itself can physically connect to it. There's, there's no reason why you can't get the flux levels from it because I think most of the Shugart compatible drives use the same signaling and the same pins so they could be driven in the same way and, and get the same flux data. Um, but I do, un I do understand that there are some very slight differences like I think the, the PC, um, the higher density modes have got like a, a pin to specify that the um, timings are slightly different. Um, but other than that, as long as you can get the flux back, it's just a software problem in terms of getting the data out of it. So as long as you can get a sector dump, and I think a lot of the old computers were in a very um, conformant structure, like the, the BBC micro disk, for example, are almost identical to what the 8271 data sheets specifies they should be in. So it's quite easy to read the data out. Yeah, the Amstrad machines, the only issue you're likely to have with those is the, they use a three inch floppy drive. And if you try and connect one of those to a PC power supply, you'll find that the five and 12 volt pins have been swapped. So right, actually okay. blow the disc drive up. Ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, you don't hook those drives up to a PC, um, but you can adapt for cables. And as you say, they are. Shugart compatible and then the on disk format is just, uh, I think it's a 754725. Seven, uh, it's the NEC standard disk controller that all right, this yeah. is based off of. Uh, so, 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 just to note that the um, Amiga uses one long track. So, most other things uh, will use uh, the index address marks and the data address marks between each sector. But on the Amiga, it just, just blats the whole track out. So you don't get all the little marks in there. So I had to do some special cases for Amiga discs to be able to image. Okay, so we've got... Well, that's, that's very interesting because you, you obviously all these intersector gaps uh, take up space. They reduce the amount of data you can get on the disc. Yeah. The reason you have yeah. them obviously is so that you can uh, be reading until you find the right sector and then turn on the right head to overwrite the one sector that you want to write. That's right, if yeah, you've actually got enough mean. memory to cache an entire track, you probably should. Yeah. And you probably should rewrite it with no gaps. 
and you'll save you space. Yeah. Actually, that's how they got early hard disks to a lot higher densities by getting rid of interceptor gaps. Yes, yeah, so part, part of what it does, the FDC chip itself, you, you give it the sector you're interested in reading and that will create a, an index address mark internally in the FDC's um, chip. And then it just has like a sliding window until it matches that um, sector mark. And then it'll, as you say, it'll switch the, the right head on once it's found that. And then what that means is that the, the written data in the data block can move a few bits either way, depending on the speed of the, the drive, if it's not exactly 300 RPM and various other factors. And we had um, Hugo on last month saying that they were spent ages diagnosing a problem with DFS. And the problem was that the, I think the 8271 had a thing where it will automatically time the index marks to wait for the drive to spin up to speed. Right, but yeah, what it didn't right, do was yeah. account for the drive then continuing to accelerate and going over speed temporarily before settling down again. Yeah, so and that so, meant yeah, so, it was writing data over the over the next sector. Yeah, yeah, that's something you've got to be careful of. Um, so I, um, in the RFI format that I sort of invented, every track that you read, it it gets a reading of the um, the RPM because that's used to feed into the um, the number of samples in four microseconds to do the, the bit widths and stuff. So on some drives, I think the 1541, because the there's more sectors on the outer tracks than the inner tracks, it does vary the speed slightly. So the, the frequency is different as well. I uh, have a, um, a flippy disk here that only has index hole on, uh, uh, on the one side. Yeah, and um, uh, one side of the disc is PC, and the other side of the disc is Apple. Right, uh, hmm. and I've never been able to read the Apple half of the disc. So yeah, you should, uh, should be able to do that with this. Yeah, that's interesting. Just read it and flip the flocks. Exactly. Yeah, it it does that itself. It it reads the data, and if it hasn't found anything in that data, it will flip the flux to see if it's a flippy disc. Okay. So uh, useful. Uh, it will also um, accept multiple different sector formats because I I heard that the TRS eighty you could you could have MFM and FM on the same track or the same disc, so it actually looks for every type of track format or sector format that it knows about and will just dump everything that it can find. Yeah, that's just, that's very interesting. We I don't think you can write. Um, MFM and FM on the same track with either of the two controllers the BBC Micro uses, but you can write uh, different tracks in different formats, and you can yeah. have different size yeah. sectors and uh, you know a whole variety of things. But yeah, perhaps another floppy controller can you know can flip sector by sector. In fact, it's not the the with the with the eighty two with the seventeen seventy. I don't think it's the the controller that's the limit, is it? You, you have to flip the, one of its pins. Um, so if you could do that at the appropriate point before issuing the, the relevant command, I reckon you perhaps you could do it with that as well. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you can actually. Uh, mm -hmm. the, yeah, yeah, there's just an external pin that you can control uh, whilst the controller is doing something and you can flip it and if the controller doesn't care, it'll just do what it, it'll just, uh, <laughs> it'll just change modes. And you can create some crazy disks doing that. So John Brown's asked, have you looked at supporting the eConnect file server disk format? No. <laughs> no. No. I'm, I, I've only um, supported the ones I've physically got copies of because I can actually image them and look at the flux patterns. Um, obviously, once you've managed to extract the, um, the data from the sectors, then it's just a logical uh, format problem. So if it's in a a fairly normal logical format then you can just image it to a, a, a dump file but um i've never seen one so I, I don't know i'm afraid okay uh anthony curtis do you want to hop on and ask your next question yeah yeah the the, the um in the was it early mid 90s um some stuff got released in, in the XDS format, like PC-DOS 7 and stuff like that, and OS2 Warp as well, I think. 
Um, and that holds about 1.8 megabytes per 1.4 meg floppy disk. Um, and it has like variable sectors per track and all kinds of other such weird nonsense. Yeah. Because I'm thinking well, I think this is IBM is there in the Microsoft's DMF format. DMF format. Now, am I right in thinking that that was designed as a format that should be written by disk duplicators and not by anything else, essentially? Um, that they do, they'd done all these tricks, like either no or, or very small intersector gaps so that you couldn't actually write them on a PC, but you could squeeze lots of data on them, which for software distribution is just what you want, because you don't want to send people a whole pile of properties. It's expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, part, part of the reason for the intersector gaps when you're writing just a sector at a time is to train the PLL. So if you start putting data in there, you can mess in the PLL and it might not be able to read the sectors properly. Um, this was like in the, in the, in the, in the 90s that there were some computer, were some computer difficulties reading the um, PC-DOS 7 disks because of the XDF format. Yeah, possibly. That's not what I'm familiar with, I'm afraid. From the point of view of archiving these things, um, if you can get the flux data off the disk, and then you can you know, post-process then that to get data in sectors, um, you know, it doesn't really matter what the what the original is, it can be something completely esoteric. If you can extract the flux from the disk, you've at least preserved it, and then you can work on mm. Um, mm. You know, turning that into something from which you can extract usable data at leisure. Yeah, exactly. And that yeah, was my just, sort of um, surprise that my BBC floppy disk, which I drive, which I thought was just meant for reading BBC disks, could actually read Commodore 64 and PC disks and all the rest of it. It's just down to what the FTC knows about. Right. Just pipping one of my questions in on more a, uh, more a comment than a question, Jasper. Um, you mentioned you were having trouble uh, tweaking the PLL in your code to get best data out there. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you'd seen a thread from White Quark on Twitter from May 2019, where they, were, um, they went through a whole thread of how to tune a floppy disk PLL. All oh, right. No, I've not, I've not seen that one. I'll drop you a link to that if you want to send me a PM on Stardot or on Discord. Sure. I, I've had a look at the one that Kia Fraser's done for the is it LibDisk, disk utility yeah. stuff. Um, and that seems to be quite good at um, syncing on correctly. Yeah, I was going to ask if you'd seen Kia Fraser's work as well, because his LibDisk and disk utilities do handle quite a lot of formats. Yeah, yeah. Um, for your 4080 track handling as well, um, it might be what I used to do was image them as 80 tracks and then post-process them. And if I got two identical track reads, then it was 40 tracks, obviously. Right. As, um, the 40 track drives, the head is twice as wide, which is That's why right, you yeah. can't write 40 track discs on an 80 track drive. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you just exploit that on the read path. So what, what I do in the auto detection is I skip to track two, I think it is, and see what the um, cylinder number is on the track two. And if it says two, then I know it's an 80 track disc or at least the disc and the drive match. So it's okay to image it. But if it comes up as a different number, I know that it's either an 80 track disc and a 40 track drive or the other way around. And I handle that appropriately. Hmm. Hmm. There, there are some discs though that are designed to be readable in either drive, aren't they? So they have done they've done something weird with the set with the sector headers and which which cylinder is declared in the sector header. Yeah, so they they yeah, do so them they, they all do. on track zero, and because track zero can be read by forty and eighty track drives, and then within that there's some code to spread stuff out, so you can run a program to. Um, convert it to 80, a 40 track disc into an 80 track disc if you've got an 80 track drive. Uh, 
Um, I have work. one comment for you, uh, Jasper. Just you were talking a little bit earlier about implementing a software PLL in your software, yeah, which is a, a real pain to do. I, I had to do a similar thing in some software I was writing. There's a, in the MFM code within MAME. There's an MFM emulation. I think the guy who wrote it, his the name Sorin or something like that, he uses, but he has a really cleverly simple PLL that is specifically okay. designed for locking on to the the um, signals coming off floppy disks. Right. It's a, yeah. it's, it's a really elegant solution <laughs> to a very complex problem. Okay, so I'd, I'd, I'd have a dig in there. I was looking for a link for it, but I can't find it right now. But it is a, it's a really simple piece of C code that just does the trick really nicely. And uh, he, he did it in a very smart way that doesn't involve lots of DSP. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Yeah, I'll have a look at that. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's a good place to dig, just, just as a hint where to look. Do we have any further questions? Any more questions? Excellent then. Right, so thank you very much for joining us this evening, uh, Jasper. Okay. Thanks for the talk.